and uh, working in in radio as well. And so uh, I'm delighted that we've we've got them here today. If you have any questions, we're going to do questions a little bit later. If you have any questions, put them in the Q and A box, and we will uh, we'll get to them in in just a little bit. Um, and I want to encourage you, and I think you'll you'll know after this is over, um, you'll want to get. Uh, if you haven't already gotten up all night, you'll want to get that from Acapella Books and Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki as well. And finally, I want to thank our partners at Acapella Books. We could not do it without them. So, ladies, let's talk about the women of NPR and their extraordinary story of the founding of NPR. Rose, Lisa. All right. Th thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate it. And good evening and welcome to all of you. And what a great gathering. I, I know this time last year, if, if someone would have told me, Lisa, that, you know, hey, a year from now, y'all still be meeting in a virtual setting, I might have been doubtful. But here's what we do know, Lisa, that 2020 was extraordinary for a lot of reasons. And even in 2021, we're still grappling with a pandemic, politics, protests and calls for racial justice. But all the more reason why and you know this, Lisa, credible news organizations are so important. Yes. So, you know, whether it's your local newspaper, your hyper local outlet, or your favorite public radio station, you know, all of this is part of what we're going to talk about tonight because these four trailblazing women, all with the thread for disseminating news and information, all with a backstory, as told in your book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki. The extraordinary story of the founding mothers of NPR. And I'm so glad and thrilled to be in conversation with you, not just as an author, but as a fellow journalist. So Lisa Napoli, welcome. I'm, I'm very honored to be in conversation with you. Back at you. Thank you so much. Let's and begin. haven't you wondered a thousand times this last year what Cokie Roberts would have said? Oh my <laughs> goodness. Million times, yes, right? absolutely. And, I, and some, some good words in there too as well. And, um, you know, but before we get deep in, into the conversation about the book, I just want to talk about 2020 for you, because I imagine you, a lot of it was spent researching, interviewing and writing in 2020. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I am so grateful, most of all, to have my health and not to have lost any of my immediate family to COVID. But um to have had a huge and wonderful project to dig into during this time of isolation. Now, of course, as you know, writers are used to being isolated already, um, but I was doubly blessed because I got at, not stuck, but I was at my mother's house for much of the pandemic. So that was just a real wonderful experience to be with her as an adult and um, to have this wonderful, I felt like I was doing my homework in, the, in this room actually, where I was researching this incredible moment in history um, at a terrible moment in our history. So it was a very interesting time for me. Yeah. You know, and what folks should understand because upon completing um, the book, you know, Up All Night, Ted Turner, CNN, and the birth of a 24-hour news, uh, 24-hour news, you told it, you told, as you put it, casually mentioned to your editor plans to get an advanced degree in biography and memoir from CUNY, but I'm gonna let you take it from there because in the next exchange of ideas and correspondence, it's kind of how all this began. Yeah, um, I did just say that to him and I have started that degree, but he said to me, well, if you wanna write a biography, Cokie Roberts had just passed away. Why don't you do a biography of Cokie Roberts? Because it didn't look like there was one. Uh, and I said, that's interesting. Let me think about it for a couple of days. And I did think about it and I did root around a little bit. And I realized, you know, this friendship she had with uh, Nina and, and Linda in particular, um, and Susan, of course, by extension, as the first, you know, recognizable voice of, of NPR. She really, she was the ultimate founding mother. And so I went back to him and I said, what about this? Get, get this, we just did this book about the 40th anniversary of CNN, but mm -hmm. the 50th anniversary of public radio is happening. And this is a perfect tie-in. I didn't realize at the time just how perfectly the women's stories, stories braided together to help advance the story of how public broadcasting um, public radio in particular came to be, but I got really lucky because it did stitch together. Hopefully I told it well, but certainly just the reality of it was that it stitched together well. 
So after that conversation, and obviously I'm assuming your editor said, yes, go for it. And we'll talk about this a bit later in terms of your process, but then how do you begin to sketch an outline as an author? How are you gonna do this? Cause it's not just one, it's four. And then sadly we had lost Koki. You yes. know, what was your, what was your, did you start? What's the outline for something like this? That's a good question. No, and I had to do it pretty fast too in order to get it out now in time for that anniversary on May 3rd. 1971, when, when All Things Considered first started transmitting. Uh, basically, I did what you probably do when you do a story, except that I had more time and uh, had to go down more roads for that one story, which was, as you say, the story of four women and the story of NPR. And of course, there's so many other people who are associated with that creation. So basically, you just lay it all out and you look at all the resources that are out there and obvious books that people have written. Fabulous resource is an archive. Um, I didn't consult this president. Actually, I did consult this presidential archive um, once because there is a good uh, President Carter tie-in with NPR that we'll talk about in a bit, but I'm sure. But um, archives are, are the godsend for people like me writing these books. But then you start, after you do that top level obvious, um, resource assessment, then you dig deeper and try to start finding the people who are alive and people who you didn't think to ask and yeah. places that you didn't think to go. So it's really, for a research nerd like me, it's a delight. Now, of course, the challenge is that doing that while there's a deadly pandemic that shut the world down, thankfully, I, I made a trip before that happened, of course, not knowing that was happening, to mm -hmm. Hornbake Special Collections, University of Maryland, that has an incredible broadcasting archive. Mm -hmm. And I was able to spend a week there and dig through Susan Stamberg's papers, the most organized person ever. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sure maybe you're one of those people who has things from the early part of your career stuck in a drawer somewhere, but she, she had it all and it had been all perfectly amassed. Mm -hmm. And so, Things like that. It's just, it, it, and then you keep going back and back through it and back and back to people because you're always trying to fill in blanks. It's kind of like being Sherlock Holmes, but, um, you know, different sort of fun. And of course, if you're going to trace the path for each of these women, and we're talking about five decades, Lisa, did you immediately come to know this would be a different undertaking than, let's say, when you were writing about CNN? You know, or your other books, or if your first one, I may ask you that a little bit later about your, your process, your style, but you immediately knew, immediately knew this was going to be a different undertaking. And then you mentioned, yeah, we're in a pandemic. I got to ask you this. Did you reach out to, to Linda and, and, and to Nina and to Susan and you say, hey, I'm going to write about you and <laughs> what they say? <laughs> yes. And that's a crazy part of writing a biography about people who are still alive, much less people who are revered because I did write to them. And initially they were reluctant to talk to me just because Koki had just passed away. I told them exactly what you read in the book and my acknowledgments that that's how it went down. Jameson, my editor had asked me and so on and so forth. And they at first respectfully declined. And then all of a sudden they started to warm to me as I would ask them little tiny questions. They said, I know you don't really want to talk to me, but I have a, how about this? Do you, can you, do you remember that? And so I think what happened, and this is the fun part of biography, is that when you're looking into somebody's life, somebody who's older, um, somebody who hasn't done something in a long time, um, or you know, that, that thing is now a fully formed entity, their, rec their remembrances are very dear to them. And when some third party comes along and starts asking about it, while it first may seem invasive, then it feels fabulous because that's something your own best friends, well, in this case, they're all best friends, but even people who know you really well may not have ever asked you before. I found this time and time again on my books um, with the CNN book. It was so much fun to go back and ask people, what was it like to be a pioneer? in Atlanta, in the first all news channel. Yeah. And people were thrilled to be able to share that information because it was just stuck in the back of their brain waiting for someone to press that button and unleash it. So, yeah. Let me ask you this. Was there any, I won't call it intimidation, but you're not just writing about four incredible women. You're writing about four journalists who started it all for all of us in a sense. 
Um, did you wait at some point? You're like, you know what? Okay, now are they going to be judging me on my writing style? Do I want to get this right? Did you go through any of that? Did you have a little tussle within yourself about, okay, how am I going to do this? Because these are four incredible journalists here. Heck yeah. <laughs> I've had it with all the books that I've written because it is this strange, you know, when you're reporting something, it's one sort of awkward because of course you want to be right. Of course you want to be right. Um, and you, you don't, you want to do right by whomever has spent time giving you an interview or, or a letting you observe something that you're reporting on. And then when you write a book that's digging deeper into that, uh, person or entity, of course, you know, first of all, somebody's going to come forward and say you did something wrong. Um, and you know that somebody's going to quibble with the way you framed it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, of course, I was, I was in, intimidated isn't so much the word, but of course I was aware of it. I was mindful of it the whole time. Because especially with these women, you know, when I wrote the book, I wrote about Joan Kroc and Ray Kroc, who started McDonald's and she gave the fortune away largely um, partially to public radio, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I had that same sense of responsibility, but in that case, they were both deceased. And um, while they were both public people, it was sort of a different exercise than with these sacred women on a pedestal public people. Um, but I'm delighted that, that they seem happy with how it's turned out, because I think, especially in the case of Linda and Susan, even though they're active, Mm -hmm. uh, Susan a little bit more than Linda. They're um, you know they're not necessarily remembered by much younger listeners who haven't had the benefit of growing up listening to them. So I think they're happy to have their place. It's 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 hopefully hopefully all good. And of course, we still hear Nina. Well, for our listeners who may be curious, or our viewers who may be curious, did you take one individual and get all your information and compile that, or did you try to get? Did you just go on a path like I'm going to get what I can get when I can get it? <laughs> yeah, although I think some days I did wake up and say, okay, today I'm going to go to Carlsbad, New Mexico in my mind. I wish I could have gone in my person and look into Linda's life because she grew up as a daughter of a grocer there. And of course, that was different than looking at Nina and Susan's early lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, with which I was very familiar since I'm a New Yorker. So um, it was just in Cokey, Louisiana and DC. Um, so yeah, I would just sort of flit about and then as it got closer to deadline, assign myself, well, today this has got to get done. But you know what? It's such a miracle to me in the aftermath that I actually wrote this book, <laughs> any of the books. How did that happen? It's yeah. a strange altered state you get into. And especially when you have to do footnotes, God help us all. The footnotes are always the crazy part, but yeah, it's a fun process, a crazy making process, but a fun one. Let's dig into a little uh, deeper into each of one of them. And, and let's start with Susan Stanberg because, you know, other than her, her, her cranberry relish, I believe that's what it is. Um, there's so much to Susan Stanberg. Let's start with her in uncovering all the different interviews and, and research. What did you discover about Susan that maybe the reader will be surprised? Well, you know, Rose, what's so interesting may seem so obvious to a lot of people watching this. And it seems natural to us. Here you are talking with me and you know, no question. But when Susan started, she started in the precursor to what we now know as National Public Radio at a time when they were educational stations assigned to universities. They were marginalized. They didn't have big budgets. She was hired quite accidentally for this job. She wanted to get out of a secretarial role, which is what women were lucky to be able to aspire to then. Even a well-educated woman like Susan, who'd gone on scholarship to Barnard, one of the finest mm -hmm. schools in the country, and she found herself in public radio. And though she'd grown up listening to public radio, as she says, it was the glamour medium of her youth. Now she found herself entranced by the possibilities of radio. And what happened was she is just such a natural interviewer and such a natural uh, voice that, um, and, and has such natural humanity. It was jarring to people at first to hear a woman on the radio doing interviews. And you know, one of the great stories about her actually has to do with President Carter, which is, um, you know, President Carter was coming up through the ranks. He wasn't yet president and they were doing stories about him. And, and Susan 
wasn't interested in interviewing President Carter at that time, but she wanted to interview his dentist because she felt that by interviewing his dentist, he had those fabulous teeth, that that would be in, offer insight into the president. And that that is just a perfect example of how she had this sort of side way into what we call in the business hard news stories and brought this humanity and warmth that again, we take for granted now, especially people who listen to public radio, but at the time, all you had then were men, white men, mostly, yep. almost entirely, delivering the news at, at dinner time each night. Um, they all looked very similar. They sounded very similar. They had this voice of authority and they had the same approach. And then along comes Susan, the first woman to co-host a nightly national newscast. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't a hardcore wonky, inside the beltway person she wanted to bring that humanity to it and she did she and did plus, she really just find the sound and then she had that tone and that cadence that only those from her region would understand all the more um which made it it, it trailblazing and i don't want to give too much weight with the book but um people need to understand that and i'm gonna use this term the hell that these women encounter and, and my apologies i have a 14 pound Maine Coon cat that's lurking around. So my apologies. That's so funny because Linda Wertheimer has one too. So if it comes across the screen, perfect. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but let's be really clear, you know, the sexism, you know, that was that they endured um, even for an environment that was supposed to be of all inclusive and something different than your traditional mainstream news outlets. Um, I want to shift for a moment before we get to the other women. And I want to talk about how much you uncovered and how much people were willing to reveal and be honest about the sexism and the discriminatory practices and even the, the nickname that they had for the corner where they put all these women. The fallopian jungle, there they were go. called. Um, they were, they, and they were the jungle because they were ferocious and uh, fallopian for the obvious reason. And, you know, imagine calling anybody that at work in any workplace today and still living to tell the story. But that's what happened then. But even before they got that notoriety as the fallopian jungle within NPR, as they all forged their lives that got them to NPR. What's so interesting is, and they all talk quite a lot about it because they want people to know how it used to be, that women weren't allowed inside the National Press Club, not just to drink beer with the guys, but to watch news unfold as it does at the National Press Club. They weren't allowed at the gridiron dinner. They weren't allowed uh, to have certain jobs. It wasn't even just that it was sexism. It was the, the expectation was so low for women. Everything was in service of eventually you are going to get married and have children and you will be out of the workforce. Um, you know, in, in Econ, I, I'd grown up hearing my mother complain that when she was a young woman and she was working and earning more money than my father, it was still my father's name who was first on the bank account. Yeah. And um, I knew, so I, I had grown up in that world aware of the marginalization of women. But to hear these women tell the stories and to look at stories as I do through the book of other women journalists who had forged trails and the difficulties that they encountered, um, it, it's really, I think it's really important for people to remember how it used to be because it hasn't been the way it is now where we can stand up and have a voice. Uh, but yes, they all encountered it and um, everything from men chasing them around the desk in their offices to <laughs> men basically saying to them, well, we have our woman, we, we don't need another woman, so we're not going to hire you. Or you can't do that job because you'd have to work in the evening and women can't work in the evening. Oh, there's the cat. <laughs> My apologies. No, it's not. It's not a Zoom unless there's an, an animal or a baby cry. <laughs> oh, it's good. Maybe you can hear the birds out here too. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it is, Rose, so important for us. And that, that's the other reason I was so excited to tell these women's stories now, because it reframes the dialogue that's so important that we're having now about the workplace in a whole different way when you know that 50 years ago, what, what women were up against. And we know 50 years ago what people of color were up against too. And that's oh. a whole nother segment. Yes. Um, let's yeah. move on to Teflon Nina. And I love that. 
Because <laughs> you know we we associate Teflon with with a famous mobster. <laughs> yes, the Teflon Don. But the, how did she get that nickname? Well, um, a variety of ways. But Nina, you know, Nina forged trails. Nina, it, it's so hard to imagine that Nina Totenberg would be anything but a reporter, right? I mean, it's just. Maybe maybe a private eye. Um, she she's just such a natural. She didn't know radio like most people didn't when they walked in the door, and still actually often don't because many of them come from print. But she was a print person, and she'd worked hard to get the right to be a print person because the byline was hard to come by. They would let women go out on stories but they wouldn't let the woman have the byline. Uh, some people would let women go out on stories. And so she finally forged her way in. She, she took it upon herself. She's the only one of the four women who moved to DC, not for a husband. She chose to go there in order to advance her career from Massachusetts where she was living at the time. And she got involved, and, and Linda says this all the time, get involved with the startup. She got involved with these uh, startup basically publications that were willing to take risks or pay women, you know, the, the bad wages that they paid women. So they, women were willing to work for them. And on those papers, she got invaluable experience. And she had a dust up early in her career that um, involved taking quotes from a story and using them in a story that she wrote on deadline for a publication called the National Observer, but um, you know, it was a Washington Post reporter. And ironically, it was a story about Tip O'Neill who was replacing uh, Hale Boggs, Cokie Boggs' dad um, in, in the house. Uh, that's a way too much complication in the tangents, but um, basically she got in trouble for that. And the truth is that it could have killed some people's careers, but it didn't. And she shortly afterwards, got uh, offered a job at National Public Radio because they'd lost a reporter, uh, or the, I'm sorry, they were adding and they needed a, a dogged reporter like her who could do everything and anything. And she flourished there. And so that's a, that's a good example of how you make a mistake when you're young and you triumph a, a past it. And you know, part of it too is the media ecosystem today is obviously so punishing and unforgiving. And it's not that it wasn't then, but you know, the world was such a different place then, and mistakes were such a different thing at that point. Um, in that in that sense, so nobody ever questioned that she was hardworking. Um, and and really, the word I keep using is ferocious because she's she was just she would not take no for an answer. Um, and do whatever it took to get a story. It's, it was amazing. Before we move on to uh, Linda Wertheimer and, and then Koki, it, it, will the reader be surprised that maybe at some point for these women, they thought about giving it up and going, some, going to another field or, you know, what, what happened? Or just staying home with the kids. And that's basically what Koki wound up doing. Um, you know, her husband's job, uh -huh came first. He was a reporter. Uh, she was in love with her husband, uh, really wanted to have a family. That was really her priority. Mm -hmm. And after the kids were born, um, she realized she wanted to do a little bit more, but bumped up against the same issue that we're talking about with everyone else. But yeah, they all had come across this harsh discrimination. And at a certain point, just wondered if it was even worth it to bother. And but they're all so smart; it's just impossible to imagine that they would have stopped doing anything. I mean, the real interesting example generationally is that Cokie's mother, Lindy Boggs, who took yeah. her husband's slot in Congress, who won her husband's slot in Congress after he unexpectedly died, had been a sort of classic um, upper crust well-to-do uh, wife of a congressman up until the point that her husband died, but that no one ever said that that meant that she was just a wife, just a wife. She was a powerful force in herself and everyone thought that her husband couldn't have been who he was without her. So I just find that a fascinating dialogue. I mean, if they'd been working class, obviously it would have been a whole different mm -hmm. conversation. We might not even be talking about them, but uh, all these women had, had really terrific parents and mothers who were role models to them, regardless what their mothers did professionally, um, who, who were there and supportive of them and 
yeah, it would have been impossible to imagine them just checking out. Were you able to talk with many family members of these women? I didn't try that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, part of the problem too is that because it was, it is a slice of the life of NPR. It's the beginning years. And it's really a slice of the life of the women. I wanted to get past all of the things, the tropes that you hear, that any person, but particularly a famous person, repeats the same stories over and over again, just because that's how we, you know, we have a certain series of stories that we tell about ourselves and that's how we present ourselves to the world. So I wanted to sort of do my best to, to drill past that and assemble and show just how different each of their upbringings were because they did come from everything from Koki to yeah. Susan and, and Linda were from more modest backgrounds. And uh, Nina's father was a very famous concert violinist. So they had such varied backgrounds, varied faiths. Um, they, but the one through line was that they had tons of support and love. And it, I just, it, I didn't, I didn't, I did try to talk to Koki's husband and didn't yeah. hear back from him. He par apparently he's writing a book about Koki, which will be interesting to read. But as a third party impartial observer, um, I wanted to just go through the available resources that out were out there. And thankfully there were tons, tons of them. I have to tell you, because I started in public radio in 1999, I had been listening to public radio for a long time. And I remember telling my dad when I graduated from college that, you know, he knew I, he knew I wanted to be a journalist since I was like six or seven. And he wow. would say, you should try NPR, you know, National Public Radio. And I, and I said, you know, being a know-it-all, you know, 22-year-old, Black people don't listen to NPR, daddy. <laughs> he was like, well, sure they do. I do. And your uncle... I'm like, yeah, y'all only two. Because you know, you, you want to hear people that that represent your community. So NPR has come a long way. We'll be very clear about that. But there's only one NPR person that I know of that a kid is dressed up as Halloween, and that's Linda Wertheimer. We had someone call in to our pleasure drive and say that their young person dressed up as <laughs> Linda Wertheimer for <laughs> Halloween. And I thought, you know what? That's it. That's how you know you are a legend. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Um, let, let, <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about Linda. And, and I want our listeners in the audience, and I'm so used to saying listeners because I'm in radio, but let the audience get a little insight into kind of where she was raised. I thought that was fascinating. Yes, it is. And I do want to get back to the race issue later on because there are some really important points to make there. But um, Linda grew up in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and her father was a grocer. She, Linda tells the story about stocking, uh, helping deliver groceries on the weekends for her parents and, and just going into somebody's house if they weren't there and putting it in the fridge, the ice cream in the fridge. That's how small town it was. Um, very friendly place. And Linda was something um, not typically expected of women, which was a scholar. She won all kinds of awards and a National Merit Scholarship allowed her to go to Wellesley. Um, she would have gone to college, which wasn't a foregone conclusion for women of her generation. She's in her late 70s. Um, but, and, and from the, the kind of background, the family background that she was from, but she dreamt, dreamt big because she had, like you, as a young person, decided that she wanted to be a journalist, although it was a little bit different because her first ambition was to be Edward R. Murrow's secretary. And <laughs> then when she saw a woman on television named Pauline Frederick, who most people probably don't recall, because, but she was one of the very first women to go on the news who actually did hard news, not weather or traffic or you know that kind of stuff, uh, women's news. She was a hard news reporter and that's what convinced Linda that she wanted to be on in front of the, the microphone or camera or you know to be the reporter herself. So she she trekked all the way east from this wonderful small town uh, to go to a elite rarefied school, Wellesley, and, you know, was a little out of water there at first, but um, quickly saw what women often see when they go to those kinds of schools, which is this camaraderie and this belief that women can do anything, which at that time, 
was not typical um, mm -hmm. for women. And of course, once she got into the real world, she realized, whoa, it's not quite like that. And so that was frustrating for her. Um, but nonetheless, she got hired. She was actually the first of the four women to be hired at NPR. Mm -hmm. And um, NPR was so freeform them. It was kind of like, oh, you do this. Oh, you do that. And she took on the, the role as the director of the broadcast in the very beginning, because there was only one broadcast. Mm -hmm. And that's a really thankless and difficult job. It's a traffic cop job. It's, um, you know, you have to crack the whip on people to get their, their stories done. But you know, you think about if she hadn't been in that role, uh, a lot of shows might not have gotten on the air. So that was, and it's good training too, to understand the component parts of a broadcast. So, and then she made her way, uh, she sort of staked a claim before she became this famous congressional correspondent as a, as a consumer reporter, yeah. because consumer reporting at that time was becoming, you know, the whole idea that you had a right as a consumer to advocate um, for yourself. She started, she started to cover that. So yeah, she's a fascinating, she's a fascinating person too. And, you know, Koki Roberts, I remember a few years ago when she was on a book tour for Capital Dames, the, the Civil War and the Women of Washington. And so she came to our station and she happened to come doing our pledge drive. By the way, ours is coming up next week. And so she's sitting there and she's, she's listening to me and my co-host talk about you know, we really appreciate your, your support makes it possible. And she just busts in and says, enough, you people are stealing if you don't contribute to public radio. That's what you're doing. You're stealing. And we said, oh yeah, by the way, Koki Roberts is here. <laughs> Koki, straight to the point, quit trying to sugarcoat stuff. Koki said, y'all are stealing if you're not donating to your national public radio, your, your local station. So open so, those wallets. Yep. Open those wallets. It was one of the, the highlights of my career, being able just to talk with her and, and just kind of soak in and absorb all the knowledge. And if there are two, maybe three women that I always talk about, it's, it's Koki, it's Gwen Eiffel, you know, and um, here locally, it's a woman, woman by the name of Zanona Clayton, who's also a civil rights activist. So when yeah. you get to meet your sheroes kind of in the industry, what you want to do is just shut up and, and soak, soak it in and absorb everything. Um, I know it had to be difficult to not be able to talk to, even if she were to decline, but I have a feeling that Koki probably would have been full of a lot of stories to share. I think she would have completely, well, first of all, she probably would have written this book uh, <laughs> at some point uh, when she had five minutes free. But also I think that she, she of all the women had this, well, they all have this sense of their place in history and the, the NPR's place in history. And you know, the, the only good news is that she was so open in her writing and in her conversation about uh, where she was in the world and where she evolved into the world. Because she even says, you know, it said at the beginning of her life, it never even occurred to her that she was a feminist, not even slightly a feminist, I think is the word that she used. And remember too, that this is at a time when feminism uh, for whom it is, for some people, it is still a dirty word, but back then it was, it was a word that was emerging and, and how you expressed yourself and protested uh, took, as it does today, different forms for different people. There are the people who will hold the signs and protest or tweet and protest or tweet and protest. And then there are people like these four women who, who protested by living their lives the way they did and standing up for themselves once they got to a workplace and joining forces and helping other women. Um, that, that was sort of their trademark. And they all say that Koki was sort of the the shining example of that for them. Um, and, and she felt it was her responsibility, the way somebody who you would imagine who'd grown up in a family of deep faith and also a sense of, we know that we are incredibly fortunate, but that's not enough. We have to pass that along to the other people, to the next people. Um, and not just take it all for ourselves. And that, my goodness, you know, what an incredible quality. But she also, it's so interesting to have studied her. Uh, and there were so many, I mean, I'd forgotten, even though I was around while it was happening in the 90s as she was ascending and 
becoming this media superstar before we had you know branding of journalists mm -hmm. she was just extraordinary um and the attention paid to her because she was such a trailblazer in in talking about politics on not just radio but on television which elevated her to a certain other brand of superstardom uh there are so many so much amazing reporting that was done um where people spent time uh followed her around and she talked very frankly about her struggles and um her beliefs so yeah it's it would have been a kick to to meet her of course um but that's a fun part about about biography too is that you're forensically stitching together somebody's life in a way that hopefully no one has before. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I just so enjoyed the, the component parts of the story and braiding them together. And so now we're at a po point where they're all at NPR. And if there is this, you can call it famous infamous photo of the four of them, I think it's in the newsroom and it captures not just the four of them, but then the equipment, which, you know, to, uh, someone generation z they're probably like what in the world is that but you know for someone like me who remembers physically cutting tape with a razor oh. you know look at this picture and they're so young but also just the way and i wish we could put that up on, on for people to see but if you look it up folks if you just if you google founding mothers of npr and go to images there's this beautiful black and white photo of the four of them in this newsroom and it just tells so many stories yes just, just so many stories yeah lisa was there anything that didn't get into the book oh wow you know i because i i did this in stealth mode and i was so focused hyper focused on on the structure of the story which you always have to be with the book but especially when you write it quickly I, you know, I think there's so many people who are always left out of these stories. That was the case in my CNN book too. That, you know, there's no way, or maybe there is a way that you could have talked to every single one of the 300 people who started CNN and convey their enthusiasm and foibles and the craziness. It was a big party time. Um, but in this case, I think, you know, it would, I wish there was more time to have dwelled on the other people behind the scenes who mm -hmm. really made it happen. But in terms of anything glaring that I, I wished I could have gotten in, I, I can't think of it off, I'm sure there's something, yeah. but it, it is fun when you focus these kinds of things. Like when you're telling a news story, you know that there's certain things you're not gonna be able to include, um, but you also know that there's certain things that you have to include sure. and um, to advance advance the story. So yeah, I. I I'm cagey about that one because I'm sure there's something, but a, it, it was a spare. You, you do the research and you hope you can wedge it in because you don't have a lot of time, like a news story, to waste um, in, in doing your It's like doing a three hour interview for a two minute piece of tape. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I've been there. I've been there with that. I'm sure, but we all have, right? We all have. Let's talk then about your writing process from your first book, you know, Radio Shangri-La, and this is now your fourth one. Has anything changed? Uh, have you grown in any in areas? Have you become more meticulous in any area in your approach or your outline in, in, in writing? I think each book is different, uh, especially when you write nonfiction, but then there are also terrific similarities and organization. Hopefully you get better. I've gotten better organized as I've gone, although I'm sure I can always be much better at it because you do have to, you know, that back section of the book. I think it was my second book. Someone said, there were so many pages of footnotes. I can't believe I bought this book and there were so many footnotes. <laughs> I said, well, you don't have to, you know, you're not paying for the footnotes. You're paying for the book and the whole production process. <laughs> and you should read my footnotes because I try to make them interesting, actually. But um, well, now you do have a lot of footnotes there, Lisa. I got to agree with the person that said, you get, yeah, I'm looking at the footnotes. You got a lot of footnotes. In there. <laughs> well, you have to you have to show your source. And it's not like a news story where you can say, Rose told me while we were standing on the street corner watching the fire that just erupted. And so that's, you know, you have to source your material. So, um, and and it is, it is a pleasure to synthesize it. But I think, you know, I just, I, this process makes me fall so in love with history. Um, I loved, my career as a journalist, but I'm so happy at this stage of my life to be looking and digging deep 
into the past. Um, it's so interesting to look at it with a fresh set of eyes and, and try to figure out how it makes sense today and how, how it's going to be engaging for yeah. somebody today. So, um, yeah, but the process is always, it's immersive and it's crazy making and, and other biographers, I host a podcast of biographers and I interview one every couple of weeks and they'll always say, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and thought, why am I sleeping? <laughs> I should be working. <laughs> you have a sense that you're never doing enough and that, that you'll never finish it because you're thought process is always changing and evolving and the observations are always coming so and and folks go ahead and you can start putting your questions in in the q a we'll get to that in just a second um lisa i want to ask you this though as you were discovering these these great little tidbits and even some other information did you see a little bit of yourself that that maybe resonated with all of them or one of them in particular absolutely i think any of us certainly who work in the profession, but any woman who's tried to juggle and who hasn't um, the component parts of their lives while having an ambition to do more, uh, will look at these women as I did and, and think, wow, first of all, the number one prevailing thought I had, even apart from the fact that they all wound up being superstars, was the amazing support systems they had behind them because you know you hear that all all the time and you know that yourself but when you see that reflected in in women who are accomplished you you get a really concrete sense of why that's so important the confidence that they had like you said before that they didn't give up that they didn't throw throw in the towel when the impulse was to just crumple down uh, is pretty, pretty tremendous. But yeah, I definitely saw myself in them and, and am grateful to have been born when I was born and, and had the opportunities that I had not having to go through what they went through for sure, for sure. And I also had a little bit of envy too, because there's nothing like being at the start as Tony Clark was at, of, a, of a new thing, even if no, no one's sure it's going to work and if every day it seems precarious, how thrilling. There is nothing more thrilling than being at a startup and that collective spirit. Um, yeah, pretty amazing. And, and if I can jump in, because that's one of the things I thought about in, in reading this book and the CNN book, is we have this tendency to look at NPR or CNN through the eyes of right now, how it is right now, as opposed to how it was then. And I just, I think the thing that's so interesting about this book is how difficult it was for them to navigate really a minefield back in, in those days. Yes, yes, it was. And yet they, they found, they, it, it really is not a diss on their, their talents, but the timing of it, that they found their way to this place and that there was the program director, Bill Seemering, who was progressive enough not to put the kibosh on women's staffers, but also who, who tried to hire the co-anchor of All Things Considered was, was a man. I mean, the anchor was a man to start with. And he tried to hire a co-anchor who was African-American, who unlike Bernie Shaw, who left a really solid and fabulous job at ABC to, to uh -huh. risk himself on CNN, which yeah. some people thought was lunacy. Um, you know, this fellow did not accept the job because he didn't want to leave the network to come to this weird little fringy radio operation <laughs> that no one knew was going to work. But Bill Seemering was progressive enough to, to be agnostic and colorblind about whom he hired. He knew he needed a multiplicity of voices, which is really why public broadcasting was created. At the time, commercial broadcasting was this uniform at least certainly with the news, um, this very uniform commodity and uh, both Ted Turner in his way and the people who created NPR in their way knew that they needed to do something different and speak outside that box that had been created by commercial media. So yeah. before I know Tony's got some questions, I just want to wrap with this. As you turn this into your editor, how satisfied are you with Susan, Linda, Nita, and Koki? I was, first of all, relieved. 
<laughs> Thank God I got that first. But when you give a book in, you know we're going to get it back a number of times along the way. But that first time you get that in, and I always, four books, I've always beat the deadline, even if it was just by a day. Um, I just, I was so thrilled to release it and to see what the editor thought. I don't let people read it while I'm writing it. I just know I'm writing it for the person who's bought the book. And uh, I can't wait to hear what they have to say because I've just been keeping it to myself all the time. So it was such, it was so great and so exciting to release it and to see uh, what came next. And here we are. So I'm so grateful for the chance to have the thoughtful conversation with you mm -hmm. about it because it's such a relief to have it out. So Tony, what questions or comments you have? Yeah, I, one thing you mentioned, Marlene Fredericks, and there were just a few uh, women in high positions like her, like Nancy Dickerson. Did, did any of these four develop friendships with them to get guidance from them? Uh, or was it really very much internal that uh, keep it the, the women of NPR and get support from each other? Well, the most incredible thing is that Pauline Frederick wound up uh, getting put out to pasture, to put it impolitely, by NBC at age 65. And, um, you know, she was renowned as, as a UN correspondent. She basically was there at the beginning of the UN. And now she was being told she had to retire. And where did she go to work? NPR. And um, she had a show on NPR in the mid 70s, and which was estimable at for anybody but for a woman to have a, a public affair I mean a, I'm sorry a foreign affairs show in the 70s was incredible and so there she was and she heard Linda Wertheimer anchoring coverage of the Senate and went up to her and Linda had as a, as a girl admired Pauline Frederick and now here's Pauline Frederick coming to her and saying you did a great job how amazing is that but in terms of the of the sorority of it um, I think Nancy Dickerson was someone whom uh, Kogi Roberts had sort of danced around in, in DC and her husband had written a profile of her for the New York Times as a young reporter, but they themselves forged this, um, what they called the old girls network. They said that we know there's an old boys network out there, so we're going to start an old girls network and they would meet with other women in town. And if somebody needed something personally or professionally, they were on it like any good group of friends would do. But they were doing that at a time when there weren't, you know, now I'm sure half, if you counted up the Washington press corps, probably more than half would be women. Uh, but that was not the case when they were doing that. So it made it even more remarkable that they, they forged together. When, when did they know they made it? When did they no. know they were secure and not a token. I, I've asked them that about the network. I've not asked them that about their, their sex, their gender, but I think that they, you know, when the third president of NPR came along, Frank Mankiewicz, uh, he was so, he, he got it. He understood that these women were not just really good at what they did, but essential to the network and, the people who made the network credible. And so he was a defender of them. And they, they also knew that together, as opposed to sniping at one another, they knew that together they were a powerful, indelible force. And so even before Frank came in, um, they, they just, well, Frank brought, officially hired Koki, but they, mm -hmm. they understood their power. And they, the mail that Susan left behind um, from listeners to read the listener mail that she was getting in the 70s as she was ascending to fame, uh, that alone would make you realize that you had power because if you saw that mail and knew these people are gonna go crazy if I'm not on the air, and they did go crazy when, when she took herself off full-time hosting. So I think, it was, I think it was an incremental confidence, but they knew how essential they were to, to the sound of the place. And certainly Koki found that when she got offered that big buck job at ABC, mm -hmm. she negotiated that she could stay, you know, as a commentator at, or a contributor to NPR. Yeah. And that says a lot, a lot too, because that kind of thing didn't happen back then, that sort of cross media pollinization. 
I just, I remember Monday mornings because she would always do commentary for NPR Monday mornings from her home that she had a little, she had a microphone and everything. And I, I could almost visualize her there with her cup of coffee, getting up and, but you, you got to the point where you just, you waited for that because right. that was so important. Or with the Supreme Court, Nina Totenberg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed this away. Who do you go to? Absolutely. You go to the, the guys, you go to Nina Totenberg. And you know what, Tony, so much was made about their friendship. And, and look, I tell people all the time, when you've been doing this as long as we have, you know, you are, you are probably going to have some friendships or develop because when you develop trust with someone that's usually about it i mean your friends right your 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 best friends and i'm not saying that i'm best friends with politicians but it's hard to do this for a long time and not develop friendships with some people as right. long as you are fair you know i tell people my job is to be fair i'm going to be fair always yes. i think that's, that's okay and i wouldn't want to hear anyone else talk about the justice Ginsburg other than nina totenberg I should be really clear. Yeah, you know? nobody takes that beat more seriously. Right? I shouldn't say that. I'm sure there are people, uh, many people who do, who do that beat. But she, yes, she lives it, breathes it, and wants to be fair about it for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, re I remember Nina's uh, description of their relationship, and one time that uh, Justice Ginsburg let something slip about a decision a day early and uh, and it was just because of the friendship but she wasn't going to act upon that because mm -hmm. that was that was a slip by a friend and you know that's the thing that I think is really good about this book is it's the stories um, in fact you grab it right in the very first you're talking about Cokie Roberts and she's in the hospital and the relationship you want to would you tell that it's it's about with the nurse and what she has her husband do tell the tell the story one of the nurses wanted oh now I can't even remember it was some sort of southern dish uh stuffing there was some recipe that she was chit-chatting. I mean, the poor woman's in the hospital dying and she's asking the nurses to see pictures of their children and has a, has a recipe that she wants her husband to bring from her recipe box from home for the nurse there. And her husband you know, pulls up to the hospital and all of the par parking attendants are asking about Miss Cokie. I mean, even till the very, very end, she was thinking about other people and interacting with other people. And you get the sense that she would have done that if she wasn't Cokie Roberts in all caps, that that was just how she was wired, was to be gracious and cordial and kind, certainly to people helping her in the hospital, but also just to everyone. You know, she, uh, there was one, one story I came across where someone had, had not treated her nicely until they recognized who she was. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't treat you nicely. And she said, you know, she's basically saying, it doesn't matter who I am. You should be treating everybody nicely. It doesn't matter if I'm someone famous or not. So that kind of ethic that came from, she would say, the nur the nuns who raised her um, or educated her, at least, uh, really lifelong, lifelong. And that exists. recipe came from? Oh, right. And the recipe came from an inmate whom, with whom she'd struck, struck up a friendship. Her husband told the story at her funeral, which, by the way, I can't believe I'm recommending that if, you know, for the big time Cokie Roberts fans, if you haven't seen the funeral ceremony um, it service, it's, it's an extraordinary and beautiful and instructive uh, drama and, and, wonderful, wonderful testimony to Cokie. Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi's in it. Um, the husband, Steve, tells these amazing stories with grace and humor. And um, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful funeral service. And that was a gift from Cokie to her fans. She knew that people would want to see it. And, and it's, it's an incredible, beautiful gift. And was pretty private about, you know, her, her illness, her condition. She didn't want to 
didn't yeah. want to be defined by it. I think that that was really the reason she kept it. You know, she was in some sort of denial that she was that ill. And it, it is, I think, I know when I heard that she had died, it was so shocking to me because I didn't realize that she was ill again, uh, as only her in intimates did. But I think that was as much a matter of her wanting to, to beat it and keep going. She wanted to be around for that election. And um, sadly, she wasn't, but that's, that's the force of will that she had baked into her. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, it, and the thing that is so impressive is when you see the three remaining founding mothers together, there is still this connection, this friendship, this, you know, it's, it's like, um, it's like it, it has never been broken. Right, right. 50 years of working together almost, you know, in the case of Linda and Susan, literally 50 years, they've been uh, watching each other, helping each other. Um, and, wh and what an amazingly gratifying experience to not only just have a friendship and a colleagueship that lasts that long, but to know that you are responsible for having put the place where you work on the map. I can't even imagine what that must feel like for them, but you get a sense of it when you, when you talk to them and you look at them, you can tell they're, they're happy. They, they, they done good. <laughs> well, and, and the thing that is so impressive is the way you hear them on the radio seems to be the way they are. I mean, yes. Rose talked about the cranberry relish. Right. <laughs> and I have heard had Susan talk about the cranberry relish every Thanksgiving or Christmas. And yeah, I'll be honest with you, Tony. I, I, I have tried to make it. Yeah. You know, not it, a fan. It, it, something went horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You're just, you're not one of those people wired for the crazy pink relish. Yeah. If, can we tell the story real briefly about Susan and uh, President Carter, since, you know, sure. that's Please why we're here. I just, I just love the story. And back to your point about the humanity, they were instructed from the very beginning, male, female, do not sound like an announcer, um, sound like a human. And that obviously carries through to today and is what endeared people to the sound of public radio, even because before it was NPR. Uh, in capital letters. Uh, but basically, Susan was brought in to, or Frank Mankiewicz convinced the president's staff to allow him to do a radio call in show, which now, of course, is so pedestrian. Of course, you know, first of all, presidents interact with the people in any way they want. But back then, it was very unusual for a president to, to interact with the constituents in that way. And a call in show was very complicated. And Susan hosted this. Uh, call-in show with the president in the Oval Office, and it was it was a big thrill for her, and it was for him too because he got to take questions from real live people over the phone and hear their voices and hear their concerns, and that was a real incredibly populist. Uh, it, example of media at a time when media was definitely uh, vaunted, you know, you can't approach a kind of world, not to mention that the presidency was like that too. People were not used to hearing the president answer personal questions like that. Uh, they, you, they would hear a press conference, maybe, and a snippet of on the news. Uh, the whole news conference wasn't on the air interminably like everything any president does is now, uh, or anybody for that matter. So it, that's just a really sweet moment in time that says a lot about the two of them and the two of them together and how they interacted and, and fielded questions from the public all around the country that was so enthusiastic about having the chance to speak with the president. Yeah. Well, th this has been a delight. The book is Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Stories of the Founding Mothers of, of NPR. Lisa Rose, it has been a pleasure to be, uh, be able to have you on tonight and to listen. And if you, two things, um, you ought to get the book. Uh, in fact, both of the books, Acapelican has autographed copies, book, autographed book plates of both Up All Night about CNN and also the Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki. Who came, who, who came up with the title? 
me. <laughs> because that, what better title could there possibly be than Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, right? I mean. <laughs> but you can, you can get your book through acapella books. This is, ladies, this has, has really been a pleasure. And be sure and join Rose Scott on WABE, A Closer Look, Monday through Friday at 1 o'clock and 8 o'clock at night. Ladies, thank you all very much. And thank, thank you. you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Great conversation, Lisa. Rose, terrific. Thank you so much. See you, Tony. Thank you all. Bye.